Chapter 65 The Whale as a Dish That mortal man should feed upon the creature that feeds his lamp, and, like stub, eat him by his own light, as you may say. This seems so outlandish a thing that one must needs go a little into the history and philosophy of it. It is upon record that three centuries ago the tongue of the right whale was esteemed a great delicacy in France and commanded large prices there. Also, that in Henry VIII's time, a certain cook of the court obtained a handsome reward for inventing an admirable sauce to be eaten with barbacued porpoises, which, you remember, are a species of whale. Porpoises, indeed, are to this day considered fine eating. The meat is made into balls about the size of billiard balls, and being well seasoned and spiced might be taken for turtle balls or veal balls. The old monks of Dunfermline were very fond of them. They had a great porpoise grant from the crown. The fact is, that among his hunters at least, the well would by all hands be considered a noble dish, were there not so much of him. But when you come to sit down before a meat pie nearly one hundred feet long, it takes away your appetite. Only the most unprejudiced of men like Stubb nowadays partake of cooked whales, but the Eskimo are not so fastidious. We all know how they live upon whales and have rare old vintages of prime old train oil. Zogranda, one of their most famous doctors, recommends strips of blubber for infants as being exceedingly juicy and nourishing. And this reminds me that certain Englishmen, who long ago were accidentally left in Greenland by a whaling vessel, that these men actually lived for several months on the moldy scraps of whales which had been left ashore after trying out the blubber. Among the Dutch whalemen, these scraps are called fritters, which indeed they greatly resemble, being brown and crisp and smelling something like old Amsterdam housewives' donuts or ole cooks when fresh. They have such an eatable look that the most self-denying stranger can hardly keep his hands off. But what further depreciates the well as a civilized dish is his exceeding richness. He is the great prize ox of the sea, too fat to be delicately good. Look at his hump, which would be as fine eating as the buffalo's, which is esteemed a rare dish, were it not such a solid pyramid of fat. But the spermaceti itself, how bland and creamy that is, like the transparent, half-jellied white meat of a coconut in the third month of its growth, yet far too rich to supply a substitute for butter. Nevertheless, many whalemen have a method of absorbing it into some other substance and then partaking of it. In the long try watches of the night, it is a common thing for the seamen to dip their ship biscuit into the huge oil pots and let them fry there a while. Many a good supper have I thus made. In the case of a small sperm whale, the brains are accounted a fine dish. The casket of the skull is broken into with an axe, and the two plump, whitish lobes being withdrawn, precisely resembling two large puddings, they are then mixed with flour and cooked into a most delectable mess in flavor somewhat resembling calf's head, which is quite a dish among some epicures, and everyone knows that some young bucks among the epicures, by continually dining upon calf's brains, by and by get to have a little brains of their own, so as to be able to tell a calf's head from their own heads, which, indeed, requires uncommon discrimination. And that is the reason why a young buck with an intelligent-looking calf's head before him is somehow one of the saddest sights you can see. The head looks a sort of reproachfully at him, with an et tu brute expression. It is not perhaps entirely because the whale is so excessively unctuous that landsmen seem to regard the eating of him with abhorrence. That appears to result, in some way, from the consideration before mentioned, i.e., that a man should eat a newly murdered thing of the sea, and eat it too by its own light. But no doubt the first man that ever murdered an ox was regarded as a murderer. Perhaps he was hung and if he had been put on his trial by oxen, he certainly would have been, and he certainly deserved it if any murderer does. Go to the meat market of a Saturday night and see the crowds of live bipeds staring up at the long rows of dead quadrupeds. Does not that sight take a tooth out of the cannibal's jaw? Cannibals? Who was not a cannibal? I tell you it will be more tolerable for the Fiji that salted down a lean missionary in his cellar against the coming famine. It will be more tolerable for that provident Fiji, I say, in the day of judgment, than for thee, civilized and enlightened gourmand, who nailest geese to the ground and feastest on their bloated livers in thy pâté de foie gras. But Stubb, he eats the whale by its own light, does he? 
and that is adding insult to injury, is it? Look at your knife handle there, my civilized and enlightened gourmand dining off that roast beef. What is that handle made of? What but the bones of the brother of the very ox you are eating? And what do you pick your teeth with after devouring that fat goose? With the feather of the same fowl. And with what quill did the secretary of the Society for the Suppression of Cruelty to Ganders formally indict his circulars? It is only within the last month or two that that society passed a resolution to patronize nothing but steel pens. Speed up your reading and enhance your memory with Moby Dick by your side. Choose the tactile joy of a physical book or the convenience of Kindle and discover a deeper way to dive into this classic. Pairing the audiobook with the text takes your understanding and retention to the next level. Ready to transform your literary experience? Check the link in the description and pick the perfect format for you. With Echo Tales audiobooks, Moby Dick awaits. Dive deeper. Read faster. Remember more. Get your book now.